Can I invite the, uh, uh, the panel for the, the last session, which is uh, the session that you've all been waiting for, uh, which is uh, uh, trying to look into the, uh, the future. And um, uh, we have uh, three distinguished um, panelists here that uh, have a clear vision of the future and how to get there that we will try to uh, explore. And so Anoushe and uh, Vivian and Emily, take a seat. And so let me briefly, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, thanks. Full service operation. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed that even Data2X has uh, um, um, throat uh, um, softeners, whatever, uh, uh, fully moderator. <laughs> so um, let me briefly introduce, so we have Vivian Ming, who is the co-founder of Sokos Labs and has done a tremendous amount of work on uh, using AI for good, and also has done uh, quite a lot of work on actually uh, looking into the ethical questions and the civic, uh, uh, civil rights questions of uh, AI. Then we have uh, Anusha Ansari, who is the um, uh, CEO of the X, X Prize Foundation, one of my favorite uh, uh, institutions that are uh, trying to uh, reinvent how we actually go about solving public problems through uh, open innovation and challenges. Uh, and I've moderated many uh, panels, but I don't think I've ever moderated uh, a panel with someone who uh, had experience in space. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted to have you, uh, and perhaps we can explore uh, what the uh, uh, gender outlook is from uh, uh, from outside of uh, uh, the uh, the atmosphere. And then, of course, um, we have Emily uh, Curry Pryor, uh, and I have a long bio that I have to introduce because no one knows who. No, I'm joking. <laughs> everyone knows uh, who. Everyone knows who Emily is, and she is, of course, the uh, uh, the driving force and also my savior here uh, at the uh, uh, at the panel. So uh, the focus is on uh, the future, and so obviously, if you talk about the future of gender sensitive data systems, we're really assuming that the future will. Um, have gender sensitive data systems as a default. That's ultimately what we are trying to achieve here, that it's not something that we have a conference about, but that it becomes the new normal, as they say in some places. Now, in order to achieve that new normal, we obviously have to address a few challenges. And uh, so instead of focusing really on what that new normal might look like, I thought it might be useful to focus on how do we get to that new normal, and also how do we address some of those challenges. And from my point of view, there are two types of challenges. One type of challenge is what I bucket uh, the ecosystem challenge, i.e. how do we strengthen actually the demand for gender sensitive um, um, data systems? So how do we strengthen actually the demand and also the understanding of what are the questions? Then how do we uh, make sure that the supply side uh, is there and can be connected with that uh, demand uh, through a variety of uh, responsible means. Um, that's the first kind of challenge. And then the second kind of challenge, and we will start with the first one, and uh, we'll uh, go straight to Emily with regard to that as well. But the uh, second type of challenges are then challenges related with scaling up. So you could still have, as we have seen, you could have you know, a clear demand, you could have a clear supply, and you could find the ways to match that so that you get actually a, a, a gender-sensitive data system. But how do we scale this? And, and particularly, how do we make it systematic, which was my end note at the previous panel. How do we anyway, make this actually um, ongoing as opposed to nice-to-haves? Um, how do we make this sustainable? Because and we have to be honest that to a large extent we are talking about creating public goods and for those that are in the audience that happens to be um, of that uh, rare um, this rare profession called economists um, uh, we all know that public goods are very hard to actually fund and so how do we sustain this and then more importantly also not only how do we make it systematic and sustainable how do we make it also responsible right because there are challenges in actually making gender sensitive data. So with that, that's the frame of analysis here on looking at the future and how do we uh, achieve that. And so let me start with Emily on really uh, focusing on how do we express 
the demand stronger. So that this is not um, anyway something that comes out uh, of a few that care about this, but that, that this becomes really a movement with a strong demand and a real understanding of what are some of the questions that matter. Um, thank you for that, and thanks again for your partnership on today's event. So I think that it's something that's come up uh, continually throughout the day, and I think that how we build more on the demand signal is, first of all, I think truly acknowledging that this is ultimately a discussion about power. And it's come up from a few people, you know, how much more data do we need? You know, some of these things are telling us things that we already know. I said it at the beginning of the day, you know, yes, we need to design gender sensitive data systems of the future, but past experience, right? Gender data is not some new thing that we only found out about five years ago that there was a problem with it, right? We've known about it for many years, but it hasn't gotten better in that time period. And so what it really begins with is the willingness of a broader community of people to demand that something changes and an acknowledgement of the power structures that are, are preventing that. Um, I'm, now I'm forgetting because I think a few people have said it, but have said, you know, look, there are, there are certainly gender data gaps and you know, we've worked a lot on gender data gaps at Data2x, but there is also data out there that, I think it was you, Sunita, who said this, you know, there are gender, there, there is data out there that exists that just isn't being used. And it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Um, but there are myriad incentive structures and stakeholders who are involved here who have to um, start to be forced to collaborate in some form or fashion for that to start changing. And so I think that, um, you know, it's certainly been, has, is, is part of why Data2x exists. You know, that's why we started, because there was an issue around how, um, in our case, on how policymaking was happening um, in a vacuum of information about women and girls. You know, that was our, that's our provenance. That's why we exist. Um, so we know that. And we've been trying, you know, and doing doing our very best, right, to start to build a community and start to build demand. But it really requires, you know, all the people in this room, all the people walking, watching on the live stream, but also broader communities, the women's movement, really starting to see this as their problem, you know, of of it's not it's not my problem or your problem or just you know just the problem of a specific community. That it's actually okay. There are communities out there that exist, and it affects those communities in very real ways. Um, and I think that that's going to be increasingly important is trying to figure out how to show um, the diverse communities that are really involved in this why it matters um, and why it has a very real impact on daily lives. I think that data can feel like this distant, technical, mathy thing <laughs> that not everyone, not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, but I think that to people, people have feelings, right? People interact with things in different ways. And if it feels like something that's remote to them or isn't actually related to their lives, it's harder to get motivated to stand up and demand change. And I think it's incumbent on, on all of us who are in this room who are already hopefully mostly converted on this to, um, to really try to figure out what are the ways to um, try to engage those communities um, more meaningfully if we really want to see systematic change. That's maybe more than you wanted, but no, that, well, I got on a roll. I, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's extend let's the roll. Keep, keep um, <laughs> it's a party now. So I, uh, I probably come from a little bit of a different background than many of you. I used to be an academic, but I study brains, not uh, policy issues per se. And then I started a bunch of companies, and now I do kooky stuff. Um, but the interesting thing that I know, two things in particular, is uh, the two times uh, where I was the chief scientist instead of the CEO, it was very clear to me, my job was not to explain how the models worked or to get e even my s fellow executives to truly understand the technical details. It was to get them to trust that I would solve the problem. And I think there's something similar here, which is the point isn't that we roll out these very complicated models and we throw equations up on slides and we even put our fellow academics to sleep, but rather that uh, we can build in trust in people that uh, this analysis produces uh, a policy change. And while I actually uh, believe in, in the position of their, their power dynamics here that need to be addressed, uh, I actually take an outcomes uh, perspective, which is to say, 
Uh, this is very short handy, but I'm sure many of you here are familiar uh, with Raj Chetty's Lost Einstein's work not too long ago. And that's highly motivating to me. I mean, if you just look at that work, which I won't bother explaining, go look it up, it's fascinating. But if you just look at that work, then you know something immediate and obvious, which is someday something terrible is going to happen in your life. And the kid that will come up with the amazing solution to that problem is growing up in a favela in Rio right now, and they will never have the chance to live that life and solve that problem. Uh, and that it's true in Oakland, and that it's true uh, all around the world. And this sort of work is, uh, to me, a recognition that there is a selfish desire to get as many people actually invested in society as possible because it makes my life better. And I realize that maybe the selfish position is not the most popular one to take. But again, from the perspective of we need to take the people that already hold power and get them to buy into these changes, getting them to see that the data supports something that would make their life better, uh, just happens it will make everyone else's life better too, is a powerful starting point for this sort of discussion. So Great. Yeah, no, that's great. And so why don't I go straight to you, Anusha, because what uh, Vivian referred to was already something that, anyway, I typically associate also with the XPRIZE kind of foundation, which is um, how do you tap into distributed supply of solutions, right? And so, so we have a demand that, anyway, we all agree needs to be made stronger. And anyway, Data to X is making this stronger every day. Uh, Vivian indicated is that if we would be able to then also, anyway, think about outcomes and the supply that is widely distributed, uh, we would all be better off if we uh, find a way to match that. So, is XPRIZE a solution? Um, I believe so. That's why I'm there. And, 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 and uh, I, I think it's a very effective solution. It's not a solution for everything. It's a solution for particular uh, problems that are very complex, that are large in scale, and requires massive collaboration. Um, and that's where we apply uh, the platform we have to solve uh, these massive global problems. And this happens to be one. Um, I wanted to maybe address, you talked about the new norm. I think um, the data is not, or data gap is not the problem. It's actually a byproduct, byproduct of something bigger. And that is the fact that we consider the norm that the world is designed for half of its population. And that was an OK thing. It was a norm. And um, now we are saying that, hey, we're here. Include us, please. We beg you. And that is what's wrong with the picture. And that's, the, I think, the lens we need to look at it. It's fixing a bug, a problem that uh, for a long time has gone unnoticed or unaddressed. And that's, um, I think, that's why it's important for us to raise the importance of this to that level at a global uh, level where there is a conversation around, for whatever reason, you know, the world was designed in certain way. And, you know, if data is the issue, why it was designed, hey, let's solve that. But it should be, the conversation should not be about whether there is data or not, because sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't uh, any data. But the fact that it, it applies to everyone, it applies to every country, it applies to every single person in different ways. Uh, for someone in the favelas, it's a different kind of problem. For us sitting in this room, it's a different kind of problem, but there is a problem. And um, that's why it's complex. That's why it's across multidisciplinary um, areas, and it requires massive collaboration. XPRIZE is looking at this through a gender lens across all these different domains. And uh, we've just um, launched an initiative that um, will look at where are the um, issues, where are the problems, where are the data gaps, and how can we make sure that there is enough data. But that's just one side of the problem. And uh, we can solve that through our massive um, you know, system of getting um, the crowd involved in every country. 
Uh, but the other side is, as you mentioned, is the you have the supply, you have to have the demand to use it. And um, that's why, uh, you know, we become very effective in raising the conversation at the policy level, um, at the global level, at the, um, you know, through UN, through our partnerships with the different governments, uh, with different cities and mayors. And um, usually these type of things um, it has a domino effect. So you need to get one or two visible partners adopt the solution, and then you have the domino effect and you can see it implemented. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to comment on everything. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I sort of chuckled. Have a uh, yes, I chuckled uh, just when you said the world is designed for 50 percent, which is a pretty generous number. I suspect most of us would acknowledge. There, uh, there was a paper I read recently, uh, an economics paper uh, that said if you really wanted to hire an amazing job candidate, hire a straight white man from a wealthy conservative background. And I thought, holy shit, am I getting punked? Is this a real paper? It is. It was a real paper. It probably should have been a history paper rather than an economics paper, because that's what it was, essentially, was just, what does history tell us? Well, unsurprisingly, the history of the economic reality in the United States is, sure, straight white men from wealthy conservative backgrounds have had a much bigger economic impact on the world than the rest of us. It surely we all understand that that wasn't causal, not in the sense that it, that paper is implying, but it also points to how data itself isn't some magic. Like data-driven policy and data-driven um, uh, companies is a very uh, common idea. All it tends to mean to me is I use data to justify the decisions I was going to make anyways. So I think there is a huge need not just to infuse data into a lot of policy decisions, uh, not just to be more, become more sophisticated and perceive the value of it, but, uh, you know, forgive my arrogance being a scientist saying this, but, you know, for us to be willing to actually try and disprove ourselves. Uh, I find that that's a very common missing ingredient in all of this, is to really test hypothesis in, in aggressive ways. Uh, and it's not that that doesn't happen in a room like this, but seeing that happen in, you know, when the sausage gets made on a policy decision paper uh, uh, during a, you know, a, a law being written or inside of a business, and boy, suddenly everything you've learned gets spun in a different way, or the deep neural network produces crazy results, which is just a reflection of history, and 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 everyone runs with it, even knowing that it's bad. Um, so. I, you know, I'm just riffing off that one single comment, but I think it is important if we want, uh, I guess the, the phrase here is gender sensitive, um, if we want that to be part of what we're aiming for is recognizing that it is very po easy to uh, naively or even maliciously tell uh, wrong stories using data uh, and, and, and be misinformed by your own models if you don't understand that the data is fundamentally that there's, sorry, every question has been studied for 100 years. Uh, it doesn't mean every research paper out of that 100 years is right. I mentioned one recently. Uh, but to absent our knowledge of that publication history as we move forward as data scientists, if you will, uh, can do real harm to understanding the world and, you know, pretending like we're solving problems for the first time and pretending like the data has the answer uh, can be a serious issue. Um, and now I will shut the hell up. No, I was just about to ask you another question. Um, um, and, then, Your and, then, and then Emily and, and Anusha can, uh, can respond, perhaps. But um, uh, it also reminds me of the work you do on really raising the human rights or civil rights uh, uh, aspects. And so that this is not, anyway, as, as was mentioned, should become part of a broader agenda um, that, uh, that really raises uh, the issues with data and with AI to a level that actually it becomes a more sophisticated debate. So perhaps if you could reflect a little bit about what you've been working on there and also what are the lessons learned for this uh, audience with regard to gender sensitive data. Yeah, uh, you know what's interesting is despite having a deep personal investment in uh, issues of inclusion, um, I really walked into it backwards. Uh, so again, I'm probably coming from a different background than some of you, but for example, I was the chief scientist at one of the first companies using AI in hiring, uh, particularly sourcing. So let's go find the right candidates. And you know, we had a big splash and 
cover of the New York Times, and it was amazing for like two years. It felt like we were truly doing something revolutionary. Um, what was interesting along the way is we were able to create for ourselves this very large data set. Um, it sounds small nowadays, but 10 years ago, having 122 million working professionals in one dating set was really impressive. And then being able to go in in a really nuanced way and look and see, uh, first, what are the correlates that exist in those data sets? Uh, and then, uh, back to what I was saying before, read through the research literature on what makes a great employee, because we know some of this stuff. And then see what happens, look at the correlates, and then look at what happens when you actually uh, build a little AI to look for known qualities in people, uh, the causal factors. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the civil rights piece, but interestingly enough, the, the correlates are often all over the place. They are not what you might imagine them to be, um, but, but I'll skip all that and simply say, uh, having built this stuff, what is most interesting about it is not what we found, although, boy, do I have tons of things to say about that, but actually its implications, which is how it changes the economics of, for example, that particular business. I don't need to wait for people to apply for a job. I can go find the ones that I think will best fit my company. I don't have to wait for people to apply for a loan uh, or insurance, I can go find the ones that I think will be most profitable for my company to insure uh, or to um, offer a loan to. Uh, university admissions, on and on. This list goes on and on. And we're starting to see this already. Uh, we're starting to see in the course of the time, just as we've been on stage, everyone in this room has been passed over for a job. Everyone in this room has been passed over for a loan. Uh, you or your kids have been passed over for university admissions. I bet you didn't even know you applied, because you didn't. Uh, and how do I know? Because I built this stuff. And, you know, we can get into the details about how bias plays a role in artificial intelligence and how a model that's making a hiring decision based on the history of the tech industry is going to look pretty ugly for women. Uh, but let's even take it a step further and assume it does it right but solely in the interest of the hirer. Uh, now, as many of you would know better than I, we're in a space where you have no mechanism to exercise any kind of civil right around employment or education or uh, economic access because you didn't know that discrimination took place. Uh, and I'm not saying accidental discrimination. I'm saying discrimination because, quite frankly, maybe uh, their model said you weren't likely to pay back the loan. You're, maybe you're just not as profitable in paying back the loan. Uh, so the thrust of all this is we've just written a piece, and it'll come out pretty soon, um, that has the very uh, nerdy title of One GPU, One Vote. I'd actually go for a deeper cut and go for One TPU, One Vote, but I thought that was a little too nerdy because I don't even see anyone getting it. Um, tensor processing units. This is Google's uh, AI uh, uh, chip. So, uh, and the the... The position we're taking is not that machine learning itself or large data sets are sort of somehow fundamentally inequality increasing, but rather the way we're doing it with a tiny number of empowered individuals and institutions is perhaps fundamentally incompatible with civil rights. And uh, until we figure out how to create not just data collaboratives, but there was a uh, National Bureau of uh, Economic Research um, uh, event on uh, applications in AI and economics recently, and some of the uh, participants threw out an idea which I've also thrown out, which is actually we wrote up in this paper, which is we need a public option uh, for AI. We need infrastructure, because right now nine companies effectively control the machine learning infrastructure of virtually the entire planet. Uh, and I don't have to think that Jeff uh, or Larry or Jack are bad people to think that what's in their self-interest is not in my self-interest. Uh, and so I'm worried that we're moving into this space where uh, the tools necessary to take all the amazing stuff we've been talking about all day and do something useful with them are only going to be serving a very small number of people. And needless to say, uh, it's a very small number of people that all look kind of the same and have similar backgrounds. And I don't think that's an interest in anything we've been talking about. 
I, I wanted to add to this um, because it's a very important point. Um, I come from a telecom background. My early career was in telecom, and there was this thing called the antitrust laws. And it prevented, yeah, it, pre <laughs> it prevented large telecom companies to come together and decide because then it was not in the benefit of the consumer, the prices would increase, innovation would not happen. And there was those regulation because there was this very immediate effect that was visible. And with AI and machine learning and what's happening now, none of these things apply because it's all happening in a black box and there is lack of awareness of how it impacts me or you or people sitting in this room. As you said, you know, it's happening to us and we don't realize it. And that's the danger of it. And it, as you said, it's not that you know, people running these companies are evil, but the fact is these are um, private companies with shareholders, um, you know, very large number of shareholders that are worried about their next quarter, you know, profits, and their next quarter profit is not, it may not be in, you know, our profit and uh, interest. So allowing them to get to this size and, and not having any reg regulation or any protection for the consumer, it is really dangerous and alarming. And it's, it's a problem that needs to be addressed now because it may be too late in the future. Great. Great. Thanks for um, for <coughs> providing us with a uh, an optimistic future here. Um, but the uh, um, it's getting but, dark yeah, outside. It's getting really dark here. But the uh, but uh, but I want to pick up something that both of you uh, referred to and, and actually connected with uh, what I tried to say at the beginning as well. And especially when you when you highlighted the need for a public option. We have in the past I've I've been advocating for algorithmic pluralism because we also need to actually. Anyway, adopt again you know, the language that we were uh, advocating uh, in a previous era, and I don't see why we should not actually have the same kind of standards in the current era. But for that, you need to, like for instance, the public option, you need to have some kind of a sustainability model, right? Because uh, part of the, the challenge that we have here is that there are sometimes alternatives, they're just not sustainable. Right, and uh, and so uh, because quite often, anyway, as I mentioned, they are seen as public goods. Foundations like anyway, the one that we are in here, quite often get called for funding them. But we all know, anyway, having been at the foundation for many years, uh, we all know that foundations, yeah, I mean, they cannot be committed forever. Uh, and quite often, anyway, they they constantly, anyway, revisit their strategies, and so it's a it's a very vulnerable position if you are dependent on foundations or uh, uh, taxpayers' money for that uh, that money. So how do we go about making an alternative that leads to this new norm? Uh, um, how do we make this more sustainable? Any suggestions, uh, Anusha? Um, well, I think awareness plays a big factor. For example, if women know if there was a sticker on a car that said, this car has not been tested for safety of women, would you buy that? No. And women make a lot of uh, you know, purchasing decision. So if the awareness and the information <laughs> was made visible, I think the business um, sort of drivers will drive uh, companies and corporations to relook at the way they design things, to relook at the way they, um, you know, design their algorithms. Uh, if you uh, looked at the drug and said this drug has not been tested for e efficacy for women, would you use that drug? No, but the information doesn't exist, so we assume because. A lot of the women in this room believe that, oh, they must have included me. How could they not have? And we don't know it. But when you learn about it, then you make different decisions. So I think the education and awareness that we need to create will drive the business models. Um, I think there's tons of data in you know, how women entrepreneurs generate more um, you know, more uh, profitable businesses. Um, but, you know, the information is not available or ignored. So I don't think it's a problem with lack of business model. The business models exist. It's lack of awareness and education about those business models. Yeah, just to pick up on that, I mean, I I really agree. I think that even though there's there's certainly been headway made in terms of greater awareness. You know, we have new information, we have new organizations who are focused on on gender data. Um, we're, we're really, we've seen 
quite, you know, quite significant changes in that way in terms of some level of awareness in the last five years or so since since we've gotten started. But there's still this piece around, I think it's this redistribution of power kind of aspect that I think we're all talking about in, in different ways around, you know, some of the questions we asked at the top, you know, who is this data for? Who is it serving? Does it represent the viewpoints um, of other people? What is what is the harm that some of this data um, is doing? And I think that part of what is going on here and one of the kind of awareness calls I think that I would make is that in the same way that we're talking about, you know, digital data and kind of passively generated data, I think that people have become passive to the data that's being generated um, about them and understanding how that is interacting with decision making that affects their lives. And I think that if we want to think about, you know, going back to the concept of data feminism that we talked about earlier, um, we have to be very intentional about, and you were talking about this, Vivian, of, of you know, we, we can't just take these models and this new, you know, these new data systems at face value and assume that they're going to do something new Neutral. We know it's not neutral. Everybody in this room and probably watching on the live stream is sick of hearing about how it's not neutral, but we know it's not. And, and so we have to be very intentional about that and we can't let up on it. And I think that this is what, going to your, your question, Stefan, around sustainability, this is part of what is hard. The not letting up on the fact that this is not neutral, that this takes a lot of intentionality and a long-term focus um, and a commitment to changing and revolutionizing not only the systems that have occurred in the past, but the systems of the future, that requires really long-term investment and thoughtful investment. And we live in, you know, kind of a short-term world where it's like, well, you know, how has that changed? How has that changed someone's life right now? Um, and the reality is that it's not that simple. And so, you know, when you think about and when you pose the really tough question of how do we make this sustainable, I think that's where it is going to take it's going to take shared responsibility. So not just people who are, you know, would self-identify as we're a gender data technical and advocacy platform, right? That's a very specific type of person. But it's not only our responsibility or the people who are in this room who care enough to be in this room, but it's about figuring out how to make that a shared responsibility of governments, of civil society, of media, media of academia, of all of these different um, kind of shareholder groups, essentially, not just stakeholders, but shareholders in, in what our future could be. And I think that trying to take that approach um, would be really helpful in, in thinking about sustainability of that not only resting on the kind of shoulders of a few who maybe have uh, uh, their own challenges around power um, and what they can do with that power. So, I, I mean, I very much agree this long-term perspective is often something that's missing. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a, a little paper once, if kids were bonds, they'd be the backbone of the world economy. Like the payoff from kids, investing in kids is huge, and yet we don't do it, which is seemingly irrational as a society, but no one really owns someone else's kids. Like, we don't see that investment payoff in a very tangible, emotional way. Uh, and so we tend not to do it, or we have big political battles over these sorts of issues. And yet, from a rational economic standpoint, if you're looking on, like, two decades out, it's crazy not to invest in early childhood everything. So, um, you know, when I talk about uh, a public option or public infrastructure or just civil infrastructure, what I'm looking at is uh, I've gotten to do some pretty kooky and amazing stuff. I built the first ever AI to treat diabetes. I built a system that could predict manic episodes and bipolar sufferers. Uh, I mean, I could stand up here literally for eight hours and give you the why you could never say no to AI uh, talk, because it can do amazing things. But part of the reason I get to do this stuff is because my life has been very good to me. So now I run a group and people bring us problems. And if I think my team can make a difference, I pay for everything, and we come up with a solution. And if we're able to, we give it all away. And the vast majority of people can't do that. And if we're looking at how do we change, how do we make the economy more inclusive and society in general, and how do we make change for groups that are underrepresented, then lowering the threshold for people entering and being able to make an impact, being able to launch a startup, being able to do a research project, uh, let me jump into this. It's a bit of a longer story, but it's a, it's a great example, both of where I'm an outlier because of my privilege, but what it could be. So there's a real common, uh, and it's directly on gender. 
very common story about wage gap in economics. Every major economist in the world has a paper on wage gap. And they largely all follow the same strain. Even Ron Shetty has one, and even it, very progressive as he is, says the same thing. Women make different choices than men. Uh, women choose not to work that extra hour on the weekend. Women choose to take time off to raise families. Uh, I've never read a wage gap paper that talks about sexual harassment, which means I don't know what the fuck they think they're talking about. But nonetheless, the actual data that they collect, I believe. Uh, in fact, back to the, um, the gig work stuff, uh, there was the Uber paper, which is kind of hard to refute. Women made different work choices than men, and they earned less as a result. But why do they make different work choices? That's what's astonishing to me is this literature just ended with they do, like you're aliens or you know we're irrational, which I'm sure is part of it. Um, so I thought, all right, let's do an experiment. First off, if wage gap is entirely a function of women's choices, it should effectively be the same everywhere. And it's, it's not, not even close. It is wildly systematically varying uh, across companies and across cultures. Okay, so what best accounts for that variation? So I built uh, a spider, crawls through the website of 60,000 companies, and collects a whole bunch of variables associated with wage gap. What's the AI angle on this story? Well, I, all the text analysis and uh, facial recognition system. Why the last bit? Well, because that turned out to be the single biggest explanatory variable. Want to know the, the single variable that best explains uh, inter-corporate uh, variability and wage gap, how many pictures of female faces were in the leadership team? The more women, the lower the wage gap. Well, why would having more women matter? Because it's difference in policy. No. Actually, it doesn't matter whether there's a difference in policy or not. The difference is young women in the company choose to work harder if they have a reason to believe that their hard work will pay off. Uh, that's my interpretation, but it turns out I'm right about everything. Um, so, uh, but we see this clearly, genuine differences in choices of work behavior in women, and we can generalize this, so uh, blacks working at companies, when they see greater representation, also engage in a similar uh, shift in behavior. So no one's being irrational, quite the opposite. Everyone's being rational. If I have all these choices, some of which is raise a family or spend a little more time working on another project, uh, then maybe I'll work that one hour less at the job because it's all dudes up there. And it doesn't matter how hard I work, I'm not going to change that. So there were two takeaways. One is being able to do a large scale, large data machine learning project to look at a classic issue and get a new insight of it. It took me two days to run that project. Imagine what it would have taken just 10 years ago. An army of undergrad assistants, uh, and multiple years running through all these quarterly prospecti from companies and getting photos and gender information, it would have been a pain in the ass. It was a curiosity th that I got to scratch an itch on. Uh, and we got a new finding. And unfortunately, it actually says something interesting from a policy standpoint. Standard policy response to women make different choices is make those choices less costly. So uh, give uh, better uh, leave opportunities and better support for working moms. Well, actually, it turns out, at least there's some weak evidence now, that that does the exact opposite. It decreases earnings and decreases uh, labor share. Why? Because you've kept the, va the value of work the same, which is lower than for men, and yet raised the value of making other choices. Uh, what we need to do is improve the value of work for women. Uh, and get the returns to be higher, as it should be, because it's irrational that we are not tapping our entire uh, workforce. So it, it's an interesting case. I'm sorry that I took a long time to explain it, but it's interesting because there's so many facets to understanding how lowering barriers so that anyone can get in and, and answer a question, a question that many people thought was settled, but you, you come in with a different exper experience, which if everyone can't tell, I was a man, I was a woman, like the world, if big clue, the world treats you differently. Um, and having experienced that, I really wanted to know, do women really make different choices than men? And we got to answer that question. I think if we could extend out the time frame and have civil society take de-risk uh, what it takes for uh, marginalized groups to actually participate and do amazing things, that we would reap real economic and far beyond benefits, but we got to look on those longer time horizons and we have to be willing to make big investments. 
Great. So um, on that note, perhaps, Anusha, do you want to um, <laughs> have a um, final observation as well with regard to what um, um, is in the future and how do we get there? Well, um, I think we've been throughout the day talking about where some issues are and how we go about fixing them. But uh, it comes down to uh, making sure that it's done through collaboration. So I think one important factor that you brought up in your study as well is the data collaboratives or, and cooperation that is required in order to address these complex issues. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to invite anyone in the room who wants to uh, work with us, participate in some of our um, look at different areas of uh, gender data gap and how we can solve those. Please go to our website, go um, dot .xprize org forward slash gender lens and sign up so you can become part of our community, online community, and, and participate in this conversation. But we want to look at, um, you know, the tough questions, ask those difficult questions, and um, invite the entire world to help us solve those. And then whether it's through um, common business sense and logic, or through shaming if we have to, to get the uh, industry to implement uh, the, the solutions that incorporates uh, all of us in their design. And um, so that will be very important. The other thing I wanted to mention is that as a woman in tech, um, and Vivian is also in a unique position, that she's been able to be a chief scientist and make sure that whatever she's designing, she has this perspective that she brings to the table just naturally. And that's missing. So. Um, you know, finding ways to get more women uh, involved in conversations and designs of everything, uh, it's important. So whether it's having more women on the boards, in the leadership team, in the design conversations, at every ask, even if you're not a data scientist, there's no reason why you can't have an opinion about something. You don't need to be an AI expert to ask questions when someone is designing an algorithm. So making sure that in whatever conversation you are, to um, make sure there is enough representation from the div diverse group of uh, us that makes us the human race is important and, and that it will be critical in, in a long-term success. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think we ran out of time um, and um, I didn't want to interrupt uh, the panelists because they had so much uh, uh, to share. And, um, soapboxing. I think it's known as soapboxing. I apologize. Um, um, no, I think uh, it was not soapboxing at all. I mean, it was uh, a clear message to the wider world that the future uh, um, might be bright if we get our act together and that we also uh, should go beyond uh, short-term thinking and really working on systems change, not just uh, data uh, uh, change, but data is a critical part of today's system that we need to uh, address. I think with that, Emily, um, I want to give you the final word uh, of the day, uh, which also will be the final, I guess, uh, uh, speech. And uh, I would like to thank the I panel. Mean, it's not as formal as all that. Um, the, it says um, cl uh, closing remarks, speech. closing, closing, closing speech. <laughs> A declamation. Uh, declamation. With that, uh, I want to thank the panelists for uh, their wonderful <laughs> insights and. and and cause an accident, and that would be great. Um, no, I, um, I really, that was uh, a really fascinating last panel. So thank you, all three of you, um, for, for participa participating in that. And thanks to all of you for being here um, for the full day. I love that this has been a full room all day. I know people are very busy, but I'm hopeful that this is actually also a really important demand signal, um, that there is a lot of interest in this topic. And I hope that we can kind of continue um, continue on that, on that uh, with that level of interest together. So um, just a few things want to thank all of the panelists um, throughout the day for some really, I mean, there were times I, I didn't know, I thought we were going to tap dance on the stage talking about data beats and rhythms. Um, there was a lot of really interesting um, insights that I think came today. And I really want to thank our research partners who 
just so everyone knows, you know, it was kind of referred to like, oh, this, 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 you know, this grand challenge and all these things that sort of sounds like there were these actually huge grants. They were not at all huge grants. And I just have to say that what all of our research partners did with very modest amounts of money, which actually when we talk about sustainability, I think that's an important thing to think about. What they were able to do with modest amounts of money, not only in the research itself, but in being willing, you know, of course, to come here today and share their insights, but also go that extra mile, right? Have extra phone calls with us, be willing to be part of a community of practice and really kind of engaging with us too as, as, over the long term has been really quite, quite meaningful. There's a few things that um, just trying to, it was, it's hard to try to think about how to synthesize everything that we heard today, but there's a few, a few observations that I just want to end with and a few key themes. I was really struck and gratified, actually, because I didn't know, you know, when you're a platform and a convener and you try to bring people together to talk about interesting things, you don't know really how it's going to go. And I was really struck um, and gratified by how quickly a, you know, quote unquote, technical data conversation really turned into questions of power and incentives. Um, and I don't know that that would have always been the case um, in, in these types of rooms and in these types of conversations. And so I just want to really um, thank uh not only the people who were presenting work, but the audience for very actively engaging in that question and and um, and showing us how much we still need to do. Secondly, and I, we heard it a lot um, in this last uh, panel as well, and really I think in every panel, just the need for multiple perspectives and making space for multiple voices. Um, we actually are kind of used to sitting in between voices and spaces and communities. We're in the data community and we're in the gender community and we're in the inclusion community. And it's sometimes actually kind of very confusing <laughs> what your identity is. But that is so, that's actually critically important because we're not going to be able to advance on some of these real deep challenges that we experience in the world without multiple perspectives and multiple voices. And then, you know, last, I think we're really at this watershed moment for the data community. There's been a lot of interest in the data revolution. There's a lot of attention around um, data and the sustainable sustainable development goals and this kind of shared social contract that all member states have made with each other of we want to achieve these goals and now how do we track our ability to achieve them. And we're at a moment now, you know, we're five years into the SDGs and now people want to see, okay, so how's that going? Tell me what's changed in the world. Show me how you're better able to to, um, to explain all of that to us. And it's, it's our responsibility, but like I said um, on, in that chair, it's not only the responsibility of these people in this room, but it's our responsibility to get other people to start seeing that as their responsibility too, to understand the way that we collect information and use information and engage new communities and in information is absolutely going to impact our ability to, to solve these problems and work towards more equality over the, last, over the long term. And just to end on um, hopefully an optimistic note, I think that, um, you know, we also heard, I think, in this data revolution conversation, talking about gender data and big data, that there's a lot of new things in this field. There's a lot that's emerging and changing, and there's a lot of dynamism, and there are a lot of other communities and new communities involving, um, engaging in this. And so I think that while it can... Um, it can become very challenging at times to try to think about you know, this huge mountain we have to climb. I'm really encouraged by the multiplicity that we're already seeing in this community um, and, and kind of the opportunity that we have with these new data sources to make things change um, as we think about the data systems of the future. I think that's a real opportunity. So alongside all of that and and some of these um, these observations from the day I want to say a I hope that you all stay engaged with us um, I'm sure there are themes that I missed in a rapid distillation of events um, I would love for us to hear from you of what you thought of today's um, experience and and some of the themes that you saw come out so there's several um, team members in the room um, so talk to us during the cocktail hour or hit us up on email always but I'd also like to thank a few people First of all, I'd like to thank Stefan and his team at the GovLab at NYU for just incredible thought partnership on shaping this event, and not only this event, but the 100 Questions Initiative, which I know there's been um, some signage there, and I would love also for all of this community to engage in that truly interesting work as well. 
I'd also like to thank uh, the very hardworking Data2x staff for just, um, you know, kind of pulling this off. It's not an easy thing to bring together this type of, um, of community. So truly grateful for that. Um, a huge amount of work goes into this. And I'd also like to just kind of say a special thank you to Bapu Vaitla, um, who has been with us on this journey from the very, very beginning when we were talking about mapping gender data gaps and dreaming about the different ways to be, um, to be addressing those gaps. Um, I would also want to just make sure to say thank you um, and make everyone aware that, you know, the only way that we're able to do this work from a Data2x perspective, we're an NGO, we're a civil society organization, is through the support and, and really, frankly, the long-term support um, from our funders. So both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are here today, as well as the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, who they're not here because it's their board meeting right now, so they can't be here. Um, but it takes um, a belief from um, I think this is really where the philanthropy field plays an important role. It takes belief from um, those types of actors to try to upend some of these systems and some of these truly tricky challenges. Um, and it's their belief in us, I think, that has allowed us um, to, to even gather this group of people today and really experiment um, and try to, to force change. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not leastly, just thank you to everyone in this room. Thank you to everyone on the live stream. I'm fascinated to see from our data of who actually hung out with us on the live stream all day. Um, I am, um, you know, you come into these types of events like, wow, I really hope that it all goes well and that, you know, no nothing bad happens and that it's the right amount of controversy and action agenda and all of those things. Um, and I have to say that I'm, I'm leaving this just feeling super energized um, and excited about the future and just grateful to everyone um, in this room and, and really look forward to working together. And with that, there is there are beverages um, outside. And uh, sorry, live stream, go get a beverage um, of some kind. And uh, there are beverages and food. And we just want to thank you and keep this conversation going, um, not only tonight, but into the future. So cheers. <laughs>